Do you know I haven't been by there? That is the old site vast it's not already gone. 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 It's and then and this is probably many years ago. Yeah. And then they they he read in the paper they're going to add sounding words. And he thought, well, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, sounding words actually is increased. Oh. Yeah. We, we heard it right even more. And who are they? Yeah. 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 Well, welcome to, I think this is episode number 10 of our logic class for maple syrup history overall. I think it's 45 or 46. I heard a lot of discussion of the Super Bowl. That's great. Um, this is the day after Super Bowl Sunday. Any other thoughts on the Super Bowl? I heard people not liking sports, people liking sports, people cooking. Um, any thoughts about the Super Bowl before we dive in? Father, any thoughts? Um, the Super Bowl, any thoughts? Were you happy, disappointed, the Chiefs won, didn't care? No, it was interesting. Um, actually, the Davis, you know, we didn't have the time I left for mm. the next. But, so when I came back, the story was different. But that's not my own response. Right. In general. True. And he did this despite um, you know, the Chiefs holding down with the ankle that was injured and all that. Legend, yes. Yeah. Do yeah. you guys... Do you guys know the Chiefs kicker is a, a Latin mass falter server? I am dead serious. You can look up, type in Chiefs kicker. His name is Harrison Butker, but you might forget the name. But Harrison Butker serves the Latin mass still now, like actively as a 29-year-old man. He was um, had like a reversion experience at Georgia Tech, I think was raised Catholic, typical, like became like like watered down Christian by his own admission. EWTN did a feature on him about this. And then like he, you know, et cetera, um, fell in with some people. The kind of classic example, like some of his friends at Georgia Tech who were devout Catholics, the Catholic Center kind of brought him back to faith. And he's, yes, he's like super, super Catholic. Um, I am in no position to judge anyone's faith, but he seems like he's like absolutely legit. Not even just like a Catholic athlete. He's an altar boy at age 30. I mean, he's anyways. Um, okay. All we're going to do today is read Marcus Tullius Cicero. I have 51 points. All we're going to do is go through point by point uh, under the guise of Plummer's logic, right? I don't have the sheet with me. I think I sent it to you though, Kristen, right? Awesome. I'm glad that went through. Remember, there's two nodes of Plummer's logic, right? And point A is just like right away, is it an article of religious faith? how we talked about with, when we investigate uh, sacred scripture, whereas Christians, we just, we uh, submit to that, that God has ordained this as, you know, his divine word. But if it's not A, we go through four Bs, right? B1 being the initial glance. Can we just see like common sense, like the, the statement being proposed for our beliefs, four plus four equals eight. That is not a statement of religious belief, but we can just stop at B1, the first glance, because, um, it's quite obvious that that is that is true. That is pretty hard to refute from a basic mathematical standpoint. And actually, let me pull it up though. I do want to pull it up. I have it here somewhere. So anyone wants to pull theirs up. What I meant is they don't have it in hand. That's you know, no problem. Right. So, like, you know, this first motion, I have it now to, to, to the two arrows, first motion to the left if you're holding in your hand. A faith test question. Well, four plus four is not a um, matter of sacred scripture. So we move to 
B, I test, or as I say, the most plumber. I have most plumb, dot, dot, dot. The thing where the most kind of blue collar worker, common sense, laid in person would be able to make a judgment immediately. Is this true or not? If that's not good enough, we move to the second motion and they go in order A, plain stated, or you ask B for the second time, the eye test. Are you sure? Are you sure you just can't just make heads or tails it right away? Okay. Then we move to B, context and authority, C, purpose and goal, D, contradictions and paradoxes. At that point, contradiction and parad paradoxes it, into kind of like different conclusions, premises, we have once more a kind of a third eye test guess, right? The, 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 the pink lines represent the kind of eye test. Context, authority, purpose, goal, contradiction, paradoxes. Okay, can you now try to just like, what do you think? You, you, can you plain state eye test now after doing some intellectual spade work, decide whether or not this is true or false, cogent, valid, whatever. If that's not good enough yet, we move to F, the fallacy check. And you see there times 10, 20, 30. That's when you go through all the fallacies. I encourage anyone who wants this info to review our first class one through three, the red herring fallacy, appealing to the people, slippery slope argument. You know, we go through all of those kind of, you know, fallacies and it, not just the fallacies, but really like what is a syllogism and, you know, what is a solid argument? What is a cogent argument versus a valid argument? Once you've done that, you're at the final phase, triple plane slate triple plane state. I mean, this is the fourth time now. Now you have to just make a guess. You've already established it's not a religious thing. I couldn't tell from the first eye test. I couldn't tell from two more eye tests after all the fallacies, all the tools. There's no, there's nothing left in your intellectual toolbox. And I mean, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, who we're going to be getting into next week, six classes of Aquinas. I mean, I was tempted. I'm not, I'm not even kidding to do a class just on Aquinas, but it's like, I'm glad we're doing other stuff too. And, and I'm glad how it all builds. But we're going to be on Aquinas a lot. And Aquinas, right? What does he say? You know, at the end of his life, everything I, I've written is like straw. Like humanity, he who's one of the greatest geniuses of all time. I mean, I, I'd almost argue it's like Socrates and Aquinas, right? Like smartest person ever. I don't know. This is totally subjective on my part. This would be a, a logical fallacy on my part to state that as objective truth. No, I mean, that's not, I don't think you can marshal objective evidence to say Socrates and Aquinas are the two smartest men to ever live. He certainly is in that class though. Even if you have like a hundred people talking to Ryan this morning about Etienne Gilson, a brilliant guy of the 20th century, all the smart people in, in the world forever under many different rubrics, you probably can fit Aquinas at least in your top 100 list, I guess, right? And an anecdote I heard about Aquinas recently, I heard that apparently he had a photographic memory of everything he ever read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said he said once in prayer, he's like. Someone asked him once, what are you most grateful for? And he's like, I have like understood every word that I've ever read. Mm -hmm. what, like that he not only could commit it to memory, but he, now he might agree or disagree with it, but he had understood everything he had read. There was never, and he understood how it connected. He said, I mean, that's okay. That's great. And what, and what the clock I heard in this brief is uh, somebody arguing that Elon Musk is like, well, why, why do you care about your whole transhumanist product? It's pretty clear already the human intellect is immensely more powerful than whatever you can come up with. Right. Because, mm -hmm. because of Aquinas. Right. Yeah. And again, we had we have, we have to get through the material now, but Ryan and I had it, you know, I could talk about this for like 20 minutes. We were talking about this morning at coffee in the morning. Kristen was down there too. And I think we read this too. Remember that he would have multiple scribes in his entourage and he is dictating a book, an essay, whatever. Yeah, so he's almost like one. he's almost like a chess master who goes and plays yeah, like nine games. I heard that about John Paul II too, that the Vatican Council, when he was you know Carl Vatio before he's Pope, he wasn't even Archbishop of Krakow at that time. He was just a priest, you know, he wasn't yet the superstar. Um, but that he would do like nine things at once. Like he was listening to the different talks and we're working on something like translations, like it's a very interesting um rejection of a very plumber's logic statement we all heard from our grandmothers of like focus on one thing you know, don't divide your energy it's like some i don't know these guys who are some of the smartest people of all time hildegard of bingen i can't wait to talk about her hildegard of bingen is so cool i think because like anyone who wants like kind of like the proper feminism minus blank 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 but the idea of like things that we as Catholics might not like or support. Hildegard of Bingen is a great rejection of all oh, women were never empowered or whatever. Hildegard of Bingen is like the greatest polymath of the 
10th or the 11th and 12th centuries and you know musical compositions and writes books on medicine so it's like a lot of these people seem to have uh, an ability to divide their attention and do multiple things at once it's it's inspirational i think but anyways what i was getting with aquinas was that like even if you're aquinas you're held the guard of being in if you do all this i think and this is again this not logical fallacy number two this assumes that i'm smart enough to come up with a perfect algorithm i'm not right this is not a foolproof thing well if, if this doesn't get you the answer obviously no i mean my algorithm probably is very fallacious and flawed but i think for the purpose of kind of a basic introductory thing if you looked at it four times establish the authority are there paradoxes and all the fallacy checks i mean you gotta you gotta just say either here's my guess or i just i have no idea right and we could do all of this for like is there is there extraterrestrial life in another galaxy and just we have to say we don't we have no idea that's totally in God's purview. We don't have enough information, no matter what we do with this thing. So it's like that can be a thing too. But so what we're going to do, we're going to go through 51 things I had today from cover to cover and talk about Cicero. Because again, what is coming up soon? Where are we now? All of that. So we, as you know, first three classes theory, and we talked about Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Last class, as you all know too, or revisit that if you missed that lecture, we talked about Cicero's life, talked about his influences. And I said, we're just going to talk about one of his most important works on duties. So without further ado, I'm just going to read you the statements, give you the page number, um, in case anyone wants. This is a red book translated by Walter Miller. Um, if anyone wants to get this, uh, originally published in 1913, it is now in the public domain. Uh, this is, it doesn't even list the publisher. Just Walter Miller, it's a red and white cover. Um, nice thin issue, hundreds of pages. Um, Read you the page number, read you the statement. Some things I'll just read, some I'll ask you for, and I'll ask you under the guise of this class. Is this logical? So he opens up uh, writing to his son. Just as I, for my own improvement, have always combined Greek and Latin studies, and I have done this not only in the study of philosophy, but also in the practice of oratory. So I recommend that you should do the same, that you may have equal command of both languages. Point number two, my philosophy is not very different from that of the peripatetics. Both they and I claim to be followers of Socrates and Plato. Remember, he's very much admitting he's a derivative, deductive philosopher working off, standing on the shoulders of giants. He himself happens to be very tall, too. Very, you know, very important intellectual figure. We talked last class, you know, basically invents the use of Latin language and, um, and in terms of rhetoric and oratorial skills, perhaps unmatched in all of history. Page number three. For every systematic development of any subject ought to begin with a definition. So that everyone may understand what the discussion is about. Is that logical? What do you think? Yes or no? Before we talk about anything, we should define what we're talking about. Let's talk about big game. Well, do you mean like the Bass Championship? Or do you mean the Super Bowl yesterday? Or you mean the big game? I mean the World Cup. I saw a thing on Twitter, like 130 million people watch Super Bowl, 4 billion watch the World Cup. Should, do, we, do we have to define things or can we assume definitions? What are your thoughts? Again, I, I, I will shut up these questions. Every question is, does this make sense? Plumber's logic. Do you, do you see any fallacies potentially, or is this rock solid four plus four equals eight? The best, like immediate. We've already established and say there's no A here. This is not sacred scripture. The authority, the authority check is this wise man, Cicero, but this is not, he himself is not claiming he's inspired by, you know, the heavenly realm, by God as he under, would understand God. Remember, living, he dies in 43 BC. So no understanding of Christianity. Obviously, he's in the pre Christian world and he's not Jewish. He would understand the idea of, you know, Exodus 3.14. Yes? Yes. Then why why should we always define it? For the sake of clear communication, for an understanding. So is that kind of a slam dunk, you think? Like well, for me it is just my opinion. Yeah. Okay. So you know what the heck you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that they know and you know what they are. So everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. We're fine. Yeah. Well, okay. yeah. Yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I definitely agree. Um, page number four, nature has endowed every species of living creature with the instinct of self-preservation. Okay. But the most marked difference between man and beast is this. The beast, just as far as it is moved by the senses and with very little perception of past or future, adapts itself to that alone, which is present at the moment, while man, because he is endowed with reason, comprehends the chains of consequences perceives the causes of things is that what separates us most from the animal world or the use of our faculty of reason what do you all think and of course Aquinas Aquinas we can talk about this is first of all don't miss this this is like it's how awesome Aquinas is that I'm going to get ahead and talk about him right now it's really cool 
Aquinas says all things, all things in existence mirror God, but it's it's, it's like it's a stratification. How do rocks and like pebbles mirror God? Simply by existing. God exists. They exist. Next level, how do like, um, you know, trees and plants mirror God? By existing and growing and changing. How do animals mirror God? By existing, growing and changing and having what you say a vegetative soul, like some, some use of like some animating spirit. And the humans, number one, the crowning thing, we exist, move and change, have all the animal emotions. We have this, you know, a spiritual, rational, immortal soul saved by Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay, according to Aquinas, the, the ultimate thing is, is the supernatural soul, this immortal soul. But does this make sense? Like on a plumber's like reason that that's what separates us from animals, or is it strength? Is it comeliness? Is it speed? <laughs> what do you all think? I think, yeah, I think that's fair enough. You know, people always talk about they did a thing in the 1970s. And they were trying to um, get like apes to do poetry or something like that. And it was like, or do language. It was not even close. It was like they could respond to stimuli, which is cool. Like if I press this button, I will get a tree. But that is not the same thing as communication. Or even dolphins with sonar. It's very impressive. It's awesome. That is not the same thing as writing a sonnet, you know? Right. Okay. I think the use of the rational faculty, you know, certainly. I don't think that's just it, though. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna go for, I want to go further than that and kind of talk. I think that the theology of the body informs us like man, well, man in his physical aspect, he has dexterity. And he has dexterity which is greater than any of the other animals in terms of his ability to make and manipulate the world around him. Um, and in that sense, like his physical nature is perfectly conformed to his rationality. Man is not a sponge, sits there, and is perfectly rational. So that that would be out of it's almost like out, it would be disordered naturally speaking for rationality to be not matched by the ability to do things and do things well, which man in nature can. Okay, that's very fair. Okay. Anyone else? Very well said. Well, so here's you know points seven through nine. First point number six, he says, nature likewise, with this is page four, nature likewise with the power of reason associates man with man in the common bonds of speech and life, prompts them to form public assemblies, associations, this idea of like the common good, you know, he says he follows the peripatetic school, Aristotle, right? He, people should get together in communities if you don't live just for yourself. But here's seven through nine. Above all, the search after truth and its eager pursuit are peculiar to man. To know the secrets or wonders of creation, point number eight, is indispensable to a happy life. You've heard the thing, better be a, a happy, a sad Socrates than a happy pig. Like against Bentham and, you know, most pleasure, hedonism, like, no. Like, finally, hungering as it were for independence. A mind well molded by nature is willing to be subject to, to anybody save one who gives rules of conduct or a teacher of truths. So like, and I'll break all this apart you know, point by point. And so it is, no, it is no mean manifestation of nature and reason that man is the only animal that has a feeling for order, propriety, moderation, word indeed. So 7 through 9 is saying, continuing your point, it's not just that we have the faculty of reason. What separates us, the search for truth, and the search for truth is indispensable to a happy life. If you're not seeking truth, forget about happiness. And if you're seeking truth, you're going to find happiness, and you will be drawn to this divine order, as it were, almost, sort of natural law. Um that really separates us from the animals where you, your desire for happiness is kind of true. Like I want to use the word beatific vision. Of course, he wouldn't put it that way, but this, you know, God is the ultimate telos, but right. That, that happiness, that all people strive after that Socrates played on Aristotle. And you see why, not just chronologically, but why we talked about them first, because it's good to have them as reference points, right? Remember Aristotle said eudaimonia is the whole point of life. Um, if you seek uh, truth, if you seek, um, if you see truth, you will find happiness. You will find this kind of self-fulfillment, best version of yourself, eudaimonia, and it will lead you to the kind of an ordering of your life. Yes, no? What do you all think? I mean, I, I think yes. I think yes. And he, say, he says here to his son, point number 10, the very form of it, as it were, the face of moral goodness, as Plato says, quote, it could be seen with the physical eye, it would awaken a marvelous love of wisdom. I mentioned often 
in this class that Ryan Alexander and I both like in the Deuterocanonicals, the, the Book of Wisdom. I'm, I'm going to guess here. I assume you like the Book of Sirach too. 70 chapters there, 19 in Wisdom, 51 in Sirach. Really cool quotes in Sirach. I'll give you two. 11.3, Sirach 11.3, the bee is the smallest of all winged creatures, but reaps the choicest harvest. Very cool. And then the last line, this is so boss, ready? The last line of the book of Sirach is 51.30. Work at your tasks, like at, when you're supposed to like, work at your tasks in due season, and in his time, God will grant you your reward. That's how the book of Sirach ends. If you, there's wisdom for you. Do what you're supposed to do. When you're supposed to do it, God will repay you when it's time, when he decides. So boss. Um, so this love of wisdom, this love, like if you read the book of wisdom, it's like a love letter to almost like lady wisdom, this personification of like, you know, God fashioning wisdom. And, and, and at one point, you know, I loved her beyond all riches, beyond all praise. Cicero certainly agrees. But all that is morally right rises from one of four sources. So Cicero says all that is morally right, correct, and leading unto the love of wisdom comes from four sources. Point number 11. One, with the full perception and intelligent development of the truth. Or two, the conservation of organized society with rendering to every man his due. And with the faithful discharge of obligations assumed. Or three, with the greatness and strength of a noble and invincible spirit. Or four, finally, with the order, orderliness and moderation of everything that is said and done, wherein consists temperance and self-control. You could say Cicero, I would argue, if, if he's the, if you, you're like, you know, he's a proto-Christian, which I don't think that's wrong. Like he has a lot of Christian points. And this book is on duty. He's very much about the cardinal virtues, you could say. He's very temperance, fortitude, you know, the idea of persevering in the face of obstacles and always seeking the higher life, the higher life exactly god bless elon musk no judgment positive or negative but not the higher life of more money billionaire forbes tech the higher life of that cultivation of love of wisdom in the soul he's all about that and he's all about everyone's you know he's about all about aristotle's golden mean he's all about the idea that this is done in moderation this is not done in excess like that you know an excess of anger, an excess of flattery, all these excess, you know, excesses are called that for a reason. And we should strive for that just distance in all things. Okay. Page number seven, point number 12. The first office of justice is to keep one man from doing harm to another. Logical or no, do you agree? First consideration of justice, that people don't hurt each other. Yes. Yeah, it seems like you can't have a functioning society without that. And we're going to read it in Aquinas. We're going to, when we get into the, the three weeks of Aquinas, when we start Aquinas next Monday, a week from today, we're going to do Aquinas until spring break. Like we will start Aquinas on February 20th and not do a new person until like March 20th. I think that's when the, we come back. So it's like I have a month of Aquinas basically, six classes in a row, and then him marinating in your head over a break. Um, what we're going to do in Aquinas after we talk about his biographical mm -hmm. uh, statistics and kind of some, We'll definitely look at his five proofs, the most famous, even though it occupies a very small part of his summa, but these awesome five proofs, I think they're still very, very persuasive logically. Yeah, okay, going all the way back, you can't have turtles all the way down. There must be some first mover. It seems very obvious. No, nothing, something can't come from nothing. So what, who's the non-contingent being that just is, right? So we'll go over all that, but I have a nice long book, which I'll probably spend four classes just reading you, but here at 51, probably 140, I don't know. I'd even bring this book next class if you want to see what it looks like. It's a great book. It's like Aquinas on the law, morality, and ethics or something, if anyone wants to get it. Because if you order it like next on the 15th, if you want it, we probably won't start discussing it till a week after that. You might get it in the thick of these things. So I'll try to remind me to bring it next class. I'll try to remember myself. But Aquinas says that. Aquinas talks about like the law. Is that the first consideration of the law is the law is nothing more than just practical reason aiming at the common good. And that seems to be one of the most first things. Why do we have law and justice? We can't have people going around being quote unquote Darwinistic. Just I just take what I want, you know, attacking fellow cavemen across the valley and just might makes right. We can't have that kind of society. I mean, you can, that does exist. It has, it's always chaotic and awful and everyone loses. It just show how Cicero is relying on Aristotle. Aristotle's political principle, kind of his general statement about cities is that the city begins to exist for the sake of life simply 
and continues to the extent exists for the sake of good life. So Cicero is the first part of that statement. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, what is not life or the good life running around in chaos? Right. Just hunting the woolly mammoth and killing each other. So, so you, you first break that chaos by just setting up things, and then you can build off that foundation something better. And then this is what Hobbes gets greatly wrong, and Hobbes says that's it. That's all. Exactly. That's all Life is nasty, brutish, and short, and so the only reason we live in communities is to, to prevent this chaotic state, right? And with no aim to anything higher, just the most base level. Yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. But is there, I guess, is there sort of a, well, to use another phrase, sort of a tipping point? And, I, and I'm just grabbing a thing out of context, really. But okay, yesterday, Super Bowl, and in Philadelphia, we have riots. There were riots, really? Yeah. Of course, right? Yeah, and that's what I mean by I'd be surprised if they weren't through. You know, like, you know. No, but so, so you're saying that the, the, the foundation of the city also, you can get anything done in a city, good and bad. So the city that's bound together, that leads to beautiful acts, can be like really good at rioting and burning everything down. Yeah, I guess, maybe. But I guess then you get to Plato, we can apply Plato's logic to that city and say, is that a city ruled by intellect, guiding will, or the appetites gone nuts? And it seems like football fans, sadly, are nothing but appetites gone wild, you know? Yes. And I, you will not find a bigger football fan than me. I love football. I just, I do. You have a big appetite. I have a huge appetite for football. <laughs> I, I, like, I honestly, you don't get me started. Like, I think football is honestly, like, guys who play manual football, it's like being a part of the Russian ballet. Like, it's like, it's an art form. Like, even if you, people who criticize football, like, oh, it's a bunch of guys wearing silly costumes hitting each other. That, that's fair. It's a fair comparison, right? But I mean, all the inter intricacy that goes into it. I remember once, you know, uh, they were saying about quarterbacks who have been tested in the NFL combine, what they have to learn and all this kind of stuff. The amount of plays they have to memorize is on par with what a person does in medical school, like just the intellectual output. They even do this thing called the Wonderlick test. And the highest you can get is 50. It, it, it's like you have 12, you have 12 seconds to, um, excuse me, 12 minutes to answer 50 questions. And an average Wonderlick score is like 25 out of 50. Engineers, very smart people, PhDs get 32, 34. Quarterbacks regularly score 45, 47. Like, like, whereas like you can extrapolate, they have like 170 IQ. Like you'd be very smart to do that. Like, even if you think it's stupid, like to, to process that information, remember it, you know, connect your mind, your body to do certain stuff. It's like, it's like live chess, ballet, it's beautiful. However, all that being said, how much I love football. Yeah, it's sad that there's still hooligan culture around that too, where it's like, I like I heard of someone saying earlier, Chris, and you were saying like, why does it matter? You're right. Really? We're going to go burn a city down because our team lost? But what if they won? If they won, all of us were guaranteed heaven, right? No. If they all won, everyone got a million dollars. No, nothing. Like, what are you doing? Exactly. So I couldn't agree more. It's, it's so sad that it's like, you know, there's such a gross, and this is famous with soccer fans, right? In Poland for a while, they had banned baseball bats because soccer bullets were using them to fight. So that's the ultimate example of that. Like this is a, a paintbrush, an instrument to play this beautiful sport you're using as a caveman club because you're a complete hooligan clown. So, I mean, yeah, talking about logic, absence of logic. Point number 13, the foundation of justice, more, moreover, is good faith. That is truth and fidelity to promises and agreements. I agree. All right, do not bear false witness against your neighbor, ma'am and eight. I mean, just like good faith, don't lie, right? Do not... When the young man goes to Christ in Matthew 19, 20, 19, like 16 through 22, what do I need to inherit? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? It gives him three things, right? Keep the commandments, sell what you have to do before, then come and follow me. He lists like five stipulations in the first part about keeping the commandments. He lists five commandments, and one of them is don't lie. Like lying is bad, right? We can't have a society that aspires to the Aristotelian flourishing and all this if we have a society of liars. Um there are, there are, on the other hand, point number 14, two kinds of injustice, the one on the part of those who inflict wrong, the other on the part of those who, when they can, do not shield from wrong, those upon whom is being inflicted. He's talking about sins of commission and omission here, right? It is wrong to commit sin. It is wrong to omit standing in defending the defenseless. He says at one point, you know, justice must be observed even to the lowest. Uh, okay, um, point 15, page 8. Men seek riches partly to supply the needs of life, partly to secure the enjoyment of pleasure. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, this book is so crazy logical. Point 16 on page 10. Again, there are certain duties we owe even to those who have wronged us. But there is a limit to retribution to punishment. Rather, I am inclined to think 
it is sufficient if the aggressor should be brought to repent of his wrongdoing in order that he may not repeat the offense that others may be deterred from doing wrong. Point 17, then too, in the case of the state, its external, external relations, the rights of war must be strictly observed. For since there are two ways of settling a dispute, first by discussion, second physical force, since the former is characteristic of man, the latter of the brute, we must resort to force only in case we do not avail ourselves of discussion. War is diplomacy only by another means. When diplomacy breaks down, there's nothing left to do than fight. He's defining here, sketching out just war theory and the limits therein, mm -hmm. right? Of like, well, okay, like you go to war and like, especially if you're attacked, then there's nothing, not there's nothing wrong with that. Perhaps that's incorrect to put it that way, but there, there are obviously justifications for war. You know, Kristen, you're our queen. You should declare war if someone's like, we're just going to ravage your city, right? Some bad guys. And, and you're, you've been this awesome queen just directing us towards this Aristotelian common good. Of course, right? But it's like, but he says here, point number 18, no war is just unless it is entered upon after an official demand for satisfaction has been submitted or warning given and a formal declaration made. Cicero is very much in his duties about propriety. He says propriety, the due process, so to speak. You tell these people, hey, stop this, point number one. No, we're not going to stop. I think you should stop. If you don't stop, we'll have to go to war. We're warning you. And finally, we don't just talk and then attack them in the middle of the night. Here's a formal declaration of war. Now we're at war. That this satisfies. Remember, he, the whole point of on duties, the whole point of Cicero's philosophy is, is justice. So you could say that there's something lacking there, the mercy aspect. I talk about Christ being perfect. And his justice and his mercy perfectly united. I almost like a hypostatic union as he's true God, true man. Like his justice is his mercy, his mercy is his justice, and vice versa. He's only talking about justice here, but there's a lot of Christian, proto Christian thought here about like what I think very plumber's logic, common sense of before you do whatever, you must follow certain rules, even towards your enemies. He, Genghis Khan is one of the most bloodthirsty, awful leaders of all time who would like execute a whole city by. Like tying people up and like putting them in a pit and then to be crushed to death. Why soldiers like partying on top of them? Like really, just really diabolical, horrible stuff. Like Nazi level concentration camp stuff. Um, there's a lot of that in the ancient world. And just like if they're not part of our tribe, eliminate them, mm -hmm. torture them, destroy them. And the Romans were very good at this. Sadly, the Romans loved to when they put a rebellion down. Look at like Spartacus, like crucify guys all the way along the Appian Way to show this is what happens if you disobey Rome. Like they are very good at giving into the worst passions of retribution. Cicero is not. He's all about justice, including moderated justice in his own passions. Even if I hate my enemy, he's not getting to the Christian point yet. You know, love your enemies yourself. Certainly he's not, he's not a Christian, but he's very much getting close to some of those kind of, you know, postulations, points. Point number 19, here it is. Let us remember we must have regard for justice even towards the humblest. Point 20, page 17, and while every virtue attracts us and make us love those who seem to possess it, still justice and generosity do so most of all. So he's saying the quality, again, this is like a, in so many ways, a letter to his son, an advice column is the wrong word, but just a kind of, you know, a fatherly, here's how you should live your life. Here, here is the good life. So he's saying, if you really want to be a real Dale Carnegie thing, how to win friends, influence people, it's not cheap tricks and pretending to be interested in what they, what they are. Be just, be generous. <clears throat> Point number 21, page 20. The soul that is altogether courageous and great is marked above all by two characteristics. Indifference to outward circumstances. And second, when the soul is disciplined, um, but extremely arduous and laborious and fraught with danger, both life many things make life worth living. So the, the greatness of a soul, a person's interior disposition and like, motive agent, is two things, is being indifferent to, uh, you know, I am just as calm and trusting in God in health as in sickness. I am just, I can handle success and everyone being like, you're a legend, you're the greatest, whatever, as much as I can handle derision. Like perfect, like St. Paul says in one of his letters, aim for a tranquil life. It's kind of tranquility, steadiness, it's once more this kind of moderation, this temperate, temperate behavior. And the second is being able to take correction being able to take proper discipline, perhaps from this kind of great leader that you've apprenticed with or whatever, someone who you do respect, being able to take proper correction and grow from it, being coachable, so to speak, if you want a, a sports authority. Here's a question I have for you, page 21.22. You must also beware of ambition for glory, 
It robs us of liberty. Is that true? I am very ambitious for glory. I just want to be famous no matter what. Is that going to rob me of my liberty? I know, right? I mean, like, let's do an Aquinas, you know, on the contrary, objection. Like, if I just seek my greatest pleasure, I mean, I'm going to have the ultimate liberty, right? Or no? Are you kind of enslaved by your constant seeking for your glory? I saw a guy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's a little bit of what led the custard last stand. Sure. Sure. I'm gonna, I'm the greatest, you know, clearer of the West, you know, I'm just gonna be this army legend. Of course, this kind of hubris often leads to overextension, obsession. I saw a thing like yesterday on, on, on Twitter, and it's actually good. This guy had given away like tons of money or something, and it was actually a good cause to help people in some way. It wasn't something like sketchy where, you know, I think it was actually objectively good. But he talks about he got like a lot of love for it, whatever. He was talking about getting a hundred thousand subscribers. Nothing wrong with that. But he's like, you know, I'm grateful for all you guys because YouTube has always been the one thing that makes me very happy. And that comment stood out for me. Hey, what happens that's gone? Is your life over? Like, I mean, if your whole ambition has been for YouTube glory, it's been changed, it's been achieved. And I don't want to be too strong with this. That great quote from Matthew or Mark 8 35, rather than 8 35, 39. Mm -hmm. You know, what profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I'm not saying this guy's lost his soul. Hopefully, I'm not at all. Hopefully, hopefully he's winning salvation by doing these acts of charity. And using his platform for good. But let's apply that. Say, like, what if he went all in, all eggs in one basket in this YouTube thing and it makes him happy and he is canceled for whatever reason? Well, then what? Like he's then maybe he's literally built a house on sand, right? As Christ says, not on stone, not on rock. So yeah, I, so so if you I think if you're all in for glory, you're right, you become a slave to that pursuit. If I tell all of you, like, you know, all I want in life is to be a millionaire. I mean, well, then all my waking hours won't be spent with like my kids or my wife or doing whatever. I'm just going to be trying to make money all the time. That might not be bad in a certain sense. Maybe I do, oh, do you want to do good things with this money and it's good to be successful in business? But we, right, you can get to the point where I forsake everything for the purpose of just this worshiping this money, worshiping mammon, which would which would be very bad, obviously. Another um, I found or another six or four, which fully read right into what this one does. Glory follows virtue as if it were a shadow. So there's a connection. That's yeah, it. yeah, that's that's a that's a perfect, it's a seamless connection. Um, yeah, I often think maybe a lot of you have had this experience, but okay, let's say some, let's say someone I would never ask people like, tell me your health problems. You know, I'd never say that, right? That's personal information. Maybe that was one of the most scandalous things about COVID, right? The idea of like you know medical records public, tell me. But maybe like let's say you have like. I don't know, some kind of chronic condition or whatever. Imagine the times when like you've forgotten about that and the bliss of that because you were seeking something else. You weren't focused on your on your health or focused on this perfect diet. And you thought, oh wow, like these last couple of days or weeks, I haven't even thought about my blank, my blank, and this is great. Because you're seeking something else. And so health falls like a shadow. But if you're obsessed with just like, oh, you know, how is my breathing or my sinus, you know, whatever, you're upset, it, it, it starts ruining your liberty, right? Chesterton famously said that. Anyone who's too obsessed with health will eventually come and have it fail, like become a, or become a hypochondriac. To be healthy is to be unaware. Imagine if, imagine if an angel right now told you and said, listen, all of you, you know, however old you're now, you're all going to die at age 95. And whatever conditions you've had from now, they're gone. You're going to be perfectly healthy in, in mind, body, and soul, number one. You're going to die when you're 95 in perfect health and go straight to heaven. All I ask you to do, here's what God wants you to do. Just go to mass as often as you can. Be in a state of grace. Like, well, imagine what a burden that would be. I mean, these beautiful stories, you know, in the um, in scripture when people are healed after all these these years, right? And like of suffering, the woman who like spent all her Mark chapter five on all the doctors, right? From verse 36. And you no, know, she just touches his tassel, right? And Jesus feels power go out for him. You know, your faith has saved you. If you knew like your whatever your your things that bother you are were gone, you would never think about them again. You wouldn't be like, oh, I used to have Crohn's disease. I'm just, that's still going to be my companion. It's not, it's gone. And there's something here about that idea of like, well, you're cool about like, if you're not focused on the, the negative thing, a health condition, an over obsession with money, but seeking other things, the other benefit will come in totally like a shadow. And I, I agree with all that. I read it maybe in a slightly different way. And for me, it was if there's no virtue in your actions and your ambitions, there's no glory. I mean, that 
you may have success, you may have fame, whatever, but back to definitions, you know, yeah. it's not actually glorious. Yeah, yeah. So just being virtuous is glorious in itself. So if you really want glory, you should be virtuous first. And, and you already and you already have glory. And you will get glory. And that's right. especially true in the Christian world, because if you're living a holy and saintly life, then your glory is not earthly glory, it is heavenly glory. You do not get praise from people on earth who will forget about you and everything, mm -hmm. but you get praise from those in heaven, God and the saints and the angels. And that matters a lot more because those people will not stop saying, good job. All right. It yeah. seems like even good things can enslave you. And, and the true freedom is actually thinking of the other and God. Um, so it just seems like I remember hearing a long time ago about how, you know, if you do a pious act, if the focus, if the end goal is the pious act, that is wrong, where you should actually focus on God, what the pious act is supposed to take you, and I, that was a real revelation to me. Oh, yeah, no, like, I just, you just think about, like, um, by the way, like, the, breaking into our stream of thought, that's why I love this class so much, it's so awesome, it's so awesome to have these great discussions. Just like fantastic discussions that like I don't know where you find these discussions seriously. Maybe other people have them, I'm sure. But like what I mean is like in this community of we're all so like-minded and yet so diverse in our life experiences, what everyone's yeah, it's so fun. Um, yeah, like think about imperfect and perfect contrition. Like, is it sufficient when you go to confession to just have imperfect contrition? Yes. You know, my love of God, I don't know. I've never met God, that kind of attitude. Yeah, I guess kind of love God. I don't know. I just don't want to go to hell. Like, I just, I, I kind of actually like doing this sin, but I really am, I am sincerely sorry because like, I believe that makes sense. I believe in justice. That is good enough to give you absolution, but way better is like, I don't want to offend my daddy, right? My God, my father, like, I love him. Like, now I will say personally, and thank God, I, I, I have two of the best parents in the world. I really do. My parents are my best friends. I feel very lucky. And my heart breaks for people that don't have that thing. Every atheist that I've met who like hates their dad, like I, my heart breaks that person. I get it. I get it because I have a great father who's my best friend. I think that's a mini version of God, right? He's, he's, he's standing in at that fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, because I, I, because I honor my father and mother with, with free will. Like I, they're my heroes. I believe in the infinite in goodness of God, in the infinite good motherhood of Our Lady. But I get it. If, you, if your father's a terrible person, I, I understand why you hate God. I get it. And that, talk about a mitigating circumstance. I get your atheism and I pray for you can overcome that. How much more heroic would you be to overcome that? But like, you know, if you have that, if you have that, that perfect contrition of like, well, I love my earthly parents, but God is so much greater. So I just don't want to offend him. That is so much better. And that imperfect, perfect contrition can work with things. Like I'm not donating to this hospital because like, I want to get in a photo op here. I was with these, these, these poor kids who are sick. And like, I made their day with bringing teddy bears to the hospital or, you know, my name is going to be the Brad King Medical Center, you know, whatever. Right. So they donated billions of dollars and everyone's going to know, like, you know, Brad King is the greatest philanthropist, like that kind of stuff. But like just actually doing it. Yeah. The secret is like, you know, letting God repay you is so beautiful. So true. So, so true. Does anyone you're, need your comment about good things can also be a, a prisoner of all these ways that reminds me of school philosophy. Totally, yeah. I am so committed to poor Martin Luther. That was his big thing. He was yeah. went to confession I think daily. And like I like again, I want to get better at that. I want to get better at that. Like I want to be absolutely a fanatical Catholic, and I am. Like I believe Jesus Christ founded one church, Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. Every, I believe everything about the faith. But I want to be better at like, and you guys know from coming my talks how much I love to make fun of Protestants and vice versa, and like you know, all in all in true and good fun. But I want to like, yeah, oh, Luther is this terrible heretic guy. Like if I was so scrupulous, I thought I would be damned every second. I understand why you do solo gratia. I'd be like, no, I just, I, I'm not good enough. My free will is completely damaged. Just, I just take it, God. I get it, right? I want, I want to be better at that. I want to think like, you know, gosh, how deep the mercy of God is. Like, and, and, and you know, we're kind of getting far afield now, but like Benedict talked about this in Space Salvi about purgatory. And he said, and I wholeheartedly agree with this. And I'm not a theologian, but he said, I think this, this makes logical plumber logic to me. He said he believes the vast majority of humanity goes to purgatory because he's like, Benedict says this again. Okay. That's not what some people like Augustine said. Sadly, Augustine was like, you know, massive not, or the majority of people are damned. Truly, God forbid. I hope that's, I hope he's 100% wrong about that. 
Um, I don't know. I will never ever presume I can, you know, step into God's judgment, right? Um, but but Benedict's like, you know, how many people do you know that you know totally deserve hell? Hundred percent. I mean, some people who are completely unrepentant, who hate God and openly say, "No, I'm not sorry. I like doing evil stuff." How many true saints do you know? And like, I remember Father Chase Hasmer once saying that he's never actually met a real saint, and I kind of agree. I know a lot of really good people. I'm not trying to be sweet. Like, I, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Like, you know, and, and everyone here. Like, but have I ever met someone that's like? I mean. It would, it would probably have to be one of those things like years afterwards you find out that like a person you knew like had, had done all this in secret and like just oh my gosh and then they of course you know canonization now but it seems he said in that letter that it's like it seems most people need some scrubbing up and c.s lewis who never became catholic but is still so catholic he, he talked about he was he believed in purgatory and he said basically like we would demand purgatory he famously says once like you die and, and even if god was like no i paid the full price on the cross come to the heavenly banquet, you feel ashamed as if like, like, look how I'm dressed right now. I'm very comfortable. I would not show up at a banquet with a hoodie on, boots, whatever, right? If you are like, no, come in. I'd be like, no, everyone's wearing like a tuxedo. Let me go take a shower and put on a tuxedo, my best. So he's like, you will demand purgatory. And hopefully purgatory, people, uh, there are a lot of saints who say purgatory is exactly like hell, except you get out. I hope not. I hope purgatory is really cool. And like you, it's like, you know, this, this black Baptist woman from the South who is that traditional, like amazing Protestant sings in amazing grace and require. She dies and Christ is like, you're amazing. You love me all your life, but you got to go to Eucharistic adoration for a week. You got to, you never believe in real presence. Go in that room. Very comfortable. No problem. That's your, you got to do that. You can't come into you do Eucharistic adoration. You're going to pray a couple of rosaries. And she, oh, yes. You know, I've loved Christ my whole life. I understand now why. Like, I, I really hope for that, you know, kind of thing. Hey, we're getting way far afield, way far afield. Um, perhaps men of extraordinary genius who have devoted themselves to learning must be excused for not taking part in public affairs. But point 25, those who nature has endowed with the capacity for ministry of public affairs should put aside all hesitation and do it. So he's like, not everyone should be a political leader. And it's very platonic, the idea of like the intellectual guardian class. But this is a vocation. Father Ben, thank you for answering the call to the priesthood. Like if you have a call to public service, you should do it, but you shouldn't clamor after it. You know, you shouldn't be a glad handing kind of, that's why the founding fathers loved and sister so much. That's why Washington is called alternatingly like, you know, American Cincinnati, American Cicero, like the, you're not supposed to seek power in a lustful kind of um, a libido dominandi way, as Augustine might say, you know, the passion dominating. Uh, point 26 on page 22, most people think achievements of war are more important than those of peace, but this opinion needs to be corrected. That's the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, point 27, next page 23, the moral goodness which you look for in lofty, high-minded spirit is secured, of course, by moral, not physical strength. He's not being a Gnostic. He's not dividing the soul from the body. He's not doing anything like that. He's simply saying, like, greatness of character comes from greatness of soul, and that, that soul lights up the body. The soul is the lamp that, that you know, courses through the body. If you, if you, have, if you are holy, that, that will... The greatest example, I think, of, of this is St. Anthony of Egypt. Anthony's Egypt, Anthony goes out in Egypt for like a billion years, right? Anyone know how he found his, his, his vocation? Anthony of Egypt, what happens? Anyone know? Super cool. It, it'll connect the threads of this class. Anyone know what happens to him? As I mentioned earlier, Matthew 6, 19, 16 through 22, the young rich man, what must I do to gain her, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, keep the commandments, sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. He hears that sermon at mass and he's literally okay and does it immediately. Like I think he his parents had died and he'd become the wealth, wealthy, like, like the duke of some estate. He's a wealthy guy. And he sold it all, took care of his, did, did stuff to like set his sister up and then went to the desert to pursue God, <laughs> an absolute boss. And he's in the desert for like a trillion years. Yes, I'm being hyperbolic, but really he's there for like decades, like 25 years, no one's heard of him. And they, like, I think, I, again, I don't, the legends about him are so amazing. It's like you want to cry. It's, like, it's, it's amazing. It's a great reading his like, biography is a great build up your faith. I don't know if he's living only on the Eucharist, but something like that. Like, and, and they go and find him in the desert. And he's like absolutely like jacked out of his mind. Like he looks perfectly beautiful physically. Like, how is this possible? We should find this guy like totally emaciated and like, you know, wasting away he's in the desert. He's like eating scorpions, right? And getting poisoned half the time. That's this point, right? That his soul is so beautiful. It then radiates through everything else. I mean, it's literally that that Bible injunction in the sixth chapter of Matthew, right? 
seek first the kingdom of God, all else will be added unto you. Like if you seek first the the the, the goodness of the soul, it will resonate through your body, etc. I wanted to say something about sisters. Go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Take off. But uh, I mean, and that's in contrast, I think, with the modern liberal, I think, down to Marxism, that it believes, which is like, if your material circumstances are bad, you cannot do moral good. Period. It's like, or it's like, it's a complete justification for all evil you do. Sure. If, bad if you're, if you, if you come from bad material circumstances, you can be a criminal and it's fine. It's not your fault. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. I encounter. Yeah, those kind of people. Sure, sure. Yeah, I was listening to a guy. So, again, fine. This is again, last time I'll say this, maybe maybe not. That's why I love this class. I love the tributaries of intellectual thought this takes us off on. Anyone know who Malcolm Gladwell is? Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell is a, I love his books. I think he's a very tipping point, what the dog saw. Yeah, outliers. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell is pretty liberal. I give that divulgent stuff. I mean, I'm a Catholic. I don't think you can be like a, devoutly practicing Catholic or even for that and be like super to the left. So I'm not super to the left. Um, but I like him a lot. I just like his style. But he had this guy on criticizing the Little Mermaid. And again, I actually have never seen the Little Mermaid. I know that Ariel is the character and whatever. And it's actually a Hans Christian Andersen's. I, I learned that it's a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. The guy who did three ugly ducklings and whatever. Anyway, to make a long story short, Malcolm Gladwell has this guy criticizing Little Mermaid on his podcast. And the guy is this kind of modern guy who basically says at the end of the story, the bad witch, her name's Ursula, I guess, gets killed. And he's like, oh, that was bad. Like it wasn't Ursula's fault. They should dialogue with her. It's like this kind of absolute nonsense. Like if Ursula is this like Satan figure in the story, Hans Christian Andersen, I think, you know, Soren Kierkegaard, these guys are all like Lutheran something. They're not Catholics, but some kind of Protestant tradition, Christian morality. No, like that, that's not, if she is truly bent on evil, he's like, well, we would just talk to her instead of you know, the prince killing her when he rescues Ariel. Again, I don't know how the story ends. Something like that. Like, they kill her with the boat, right? And Ariel gets her voice back, whatever. I'm not even trying to be funny here. Like, I, I don't know the story perfectly. But the guy was complaining that Ursula had been killed. They should have dialogued with her. And it's like, come on. Like, so, so she's every bad guy, it's never their fault. The complete abdication of personal responsibility, no matter what. You know, I do all these. Morgan Freeman was on some show denouncing this idea and he's like everyone can pull themselves up by their bootstraps he's like go for it you know the, you, the bus runs get on the bus try your best don't make these excuses the real thing well just on the subject of the little mermaid compare the movie versus the original story what happens to ariel and give me i know you got to go to class but what, I don't, what happens how are they different i don't, I don't uh, know in the story she has to sacrifice her life to the prince because of the deal she made for him she thinks that her because the mermaid's of a mortal soul she's going to just you know, into foam know, or something right but, yeah but she becomes like a spirit of the air and basically in a purgatorial state as opposed to whatever the heck happened which is like you be you good uh whoops tri- i'm i'm king triton and i say that uh it was okay that you i fixed it yeah right. thank you for being disobedient which is what happens in the disney movie. got it got it cool thank you for that yeah. um page 27 point number 28 it is as much of a sign of weakness to give way to one's feelings of success as an adversity. That's what we're saying earlier. A lot of people can't handle adversity. You know who I know who can't handle adversity very well? You want to know who? Me. I'm the whiniest baby. Like, I'll confess something. I, my, 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 I'm dead serious. My, my sweet little boy, my five-year-old, he has some kind of like, like rash on his face. You have to give him a cycle beer for it. It's like a herpes thing, whatever, like the cold sore stuff. So I recently, and I live in this disgusting, entitled, truly disgusting, like denounce me, attitude of like, I don't have health problems. I'm better than that. You know, it's just so awful, right? And recently I've been humbled by having, I, 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 every two weeks there's like an outbreak of hives. Like you have like itchy skin, eczema stuff, whatever, you know, and I hate it. And I get so whiny about it. It's like, gosh, like, what is God trying to tell me through that? You know, like offer, offer this up. And people have real bad problems, you know, and like, had like outbreaks of hives, like a swollen lip and like whatever and things like where you know um you just have these nagging kind of things and it's like gosh what do people really deal with real crosses you know and i'm complaining about having itchy skin once in a while i know people poor people have had like eczema their whole lives you know, like 40 50 years of like terrible scratching and it's like it's like great i'm like majority of people who don't do adversity well and complain at first drop oh this is you know i well you should sympathize me but it's, it's just as important to be able to handle success. And I felt this failing too. 
like I've felt sometimes where like, you know, oh, some things have been going really good. And so I'm going to be like super like, just, I don't know. I do always have my mom's words in my head about like, it's so true. Like you should not overshare your success. Like person X, whoever might not want to hear that you just did all this stuff because they just got fired from their job. And like, you're just twisting out. Oh, mom, well, I got fired from my job, but as you, you know, won the lottery. So let's celebrate you. Like there is, there's kind of, you should keep it to yourself, bad and good. What he's saying. Right. But it's like, yeah, I felt that too. Like not being able to handle success. Like what would happen? I have zero fame. Like, I, you know, I'm 0% famous. What would happen if like, oh, you know, my books became very famous or whatever. Like, could I handle that? Could I handle it and still be normal? Or would I be a total clown idiot? You know, now, like, you know, now I, people read my books. I'm this Catholic author. So I'm going to demand like a prime parking spot. Or I'm going to treat people like, I sure hope not. I really hope not, you know? But so that, that's just great words there. Like the true holy man or woman can be like, I have an outbreak of hives. Okay, I offer this for souls in purgatory. I just got a $5 million book contract. Okay, you know, God, to God be the glory. Not too high or too low. It's tranquility again, which is such a huge point of this book, I think. You're talking about success. I had a weird thing with that. I was trying to do something, doing some curve thing and stuff and crazy things like that. And I was looking, I was in voice at the time, but I was looking with a kind of like that when I get figure out how to do it. Anyway, I got this thing to work kind of. And I showed it to him, and you could, you know, read the read the curve or the, you know, and see what the results were. And I showed it to him. And he looked at it and said, well, don't argue with success. It worked. Right. It's kind of a yeah. And see, that's a different it, idea. But see, kind of funny the way he well, it. exactly. And that's so American. I don't know if all of you know this, but the only congenital American philosophy is pragmatism. The pragmatism, people always struggle. How, by the way, I want to see how much battery I've left. I had 60%, I have 28%. Okay, so that should be still good. Um, people always struggle to define pragmatism. Pragmatism simply means, ready? The uh, literal definition is truth is what works. Well, you can see why it's not a very good Catholic philosophy because truth is what works might be like bomb this country or eliminate these people. That works for our goal, you know, like, but the kind of like general business is all about pragmatism, right? Well, I guess we're going to do more strawberry scones because that got us our highest thing. Don't, it's not broke, don't fix it. Do it to people like, so with, with your friend, I'm not, that he's not wrong. There is, there's a, actually like a, a true point to that. Like if it's working, I mean, stay, that maybe that's, there's a, there's a reason why it's down that. But as Americans, all of us, and I say this as an American myself, like we fall into that trap of like, if it works, I'm not going to consider anything else. It just worked. You know, imagine if someone like hypothetically again, like gave me a pill and was like, I'm not telling you what this is. You take this pill, like you're going to sleep perfect and feel great. I might be tempted, like, I don't care what it is. I'm just going to keep it in works, right? I don't care if it's like morally uh, questionable or this or that. Like, if it works, that's all I need to know. And so it's like, yeah. And he's saying not that. He's saying that, that, that you have to have this kind of principles, moderation, golden mean, truth, justice. What we would call these cardinal virtues, conforming your decisions beyond just, you know, willful behavior. And well, got the job done. That that's all I need to know. Okay, let's skip ahead. Um, we're on page thirty, point number thirty. We still have twenty-one points, but hopefully we'll go kind of fast. The discussion is so rich, so good today. And I don't know if anyone noticed on YouTube. I haven't just seen the time of our videos. Like, often it's an hour, 10, 59 minutes. The last class has been only 52 minutes. We're already an hour now. I mean, we're just going to be a very complete thick class, which is, which is great. It's been a great discussion, a lot of good stuff, but to also over, avoid overwhelming. I'm just going to kind of read these last things out and then kind of we'll finish up. From this, we see that all appetites must be controlled and calmed. We must take infinite pains not to do anything from impulse or random. Point number 30 says, yeah, he's always talking about that. Calming your appetites. Um, He's very much about natural law intellectually, but also on page 37, point 32 here, I skipped over and I, I will skip over some points. Point 32, nature seems to have a wonderful plan in the construction of our bodies. No, your body, oh, the human body is ugly, you think? Well, how did you fix it? What, add an arm out of your back? Have three legs, two heads? And then it, right, all you have to do is that exercise with logic and realize well, what's wrong about it. No, the human body is beautiful. The proportionality, the arms, it's very, it's very comely. It's very... You know, it's very well designed. And we, of course, extrapolate that to the image and likeness of God, number one in the soul, but totally, and have this kind of Catholic deeper understanding than just, than just natural law. But even just by natural law, 
it's kind of very obvious the human body's cool. Like you can do a lot of great things with it. It seems to work very, very well. And I think very much for that idea. Page 39.33, conversation should not should be easy and not dogmatic. It should have the spice of wit. You know who, who is the spice of wit? Anyone can tell me who the ultimate wit Catholic author is we're discussing during the semester. Yeah, Chesterton very much, even when denouncing his Chesterton writes a book called Heretics, like calling out people. Imagine today writing a book, you know, denouncing like people by name. That's very combative. He did it with wit, gentleness, and I'm like, love. Like, I'm just going to, you know, the, the heretical part here is the ideas that people hold. I don't want to hold a personal grudge. Like, if you have wit and levity to what you say, you might be given a more fair hearing to, right? Point 34, avoid exhibitions of passion. Point 35, it's a bad taste to talk about oneself. He says, quote, amongst your heroes to play the braggart captain. Yeah, right? I mean, like, come on. Um, people, if someone is sincerely narcissistic and is like, no, I really am the best, like, no one, no one wants to hear that. I, I, I don't I think it's, that might be the most plumber's logic point I've covered all of us. If a person were to honestly, like, not, not sarcastically or not even say, like, well, you know, in my experience as a business owner, like, this has worked, that's good. Like, I think I have the right answer. Like, you know, if a person was honestly like, I want more events honoring my greatness. Like, no one wants, no one, no one is interested in that. Let me let me ask you this. I, I found another one that again, it's go for it. Yeah, almost feels like a foil. Um, I wonder if you think this is sarcasm or what? Well, he says uh, very quick. No one can give you better advice than yourself. Yeah, so no, I don't think he's being sarcastic. What does it mean? Yeah, so I think you're right, because it seems contradictory to the last yeah. point. I think the last point he means is like you should not flaunt your elocution, your education in the company of others to demean them and raise yourself up. What he's saying is you have free will. It's a very Catholic point. You have free will, you have Matthew 25, the talents. Like, do not bury your talent. No one can give, give you better, better education than yourself, provided you're following all this like duty-bound philosophy of being temperate, hungry to learn. Remember he said the whole point of humanity is the search for truth. So it's like, if you are taking full responsibility of I am an unrepeatable person who's been endowed with certain gifts and qualities, I'm going to make them, make the most of them, you should be able to be like, okay, I am confident that I can make certain decisions even in my flawed state. That that the worst, the, the analog to that would be the worst person who refuses to learn, refuses to seek truth, and then it flip-flops in the wind. And when something comes along, has no idea about the question being asked and just says, well, I'll do what the experts tell me. Or I'll, I'll, like throws off his responsibility to learn, to, to, to be self-taught unto other people just telling him what to do. And it's, kind of, it's a recipe for tyranny at that point. He's very big on republicanism, people being involved. Maybe the arist, ar, um, aristocratic class, specifically, not, not a pure Democrat, but he, he's like a healthy society of people seeking the common good taking serious their obligation to be educated, to contribute. And so um, I, I think that's more what, what he's getting at. Whereas a, a rescue for tyranny is a bunch of people who don't care enough to learn, who who so out of a false modesty say, well, I'm not important, I'm not going to learn. And then they just become like sheep puppets for tyranny. So maybe in today's world with the internet, you can find whatever you want, you know, pro and con on a given issue. And so knowing that, um, that's the fallacy. So don't go there, go inside. Exactly. Yeah. Don't 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 outsource all of your decisions. Exactly. Well, what you're doing when you look at the internet and ask other people for advice and stuff like that, or take advice from other people, is you're gathering data. Mm -hmm. And then you advise yourself by analyzing the data and making other decisions. And sure. And I think that's what so he as we've established, he's very much about the golden mean and balance. And so he would say, like, of course, there, there is there is an extreme here to to avoid as well. It doesn't mean like, you know, shutting out the 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 other voices. There is a an idea of doing your due, due diligence. I just think what he's saying is like ultimately only you can decide. You can't. John Paul II talked about this in his philosophy. He's like, man is non-transferable. I can't transfer my will to Kristen. I can even tell her like, whatever she tells me to do, I'll do. But again, I have to do it. Like if she's like, do this diet or drive this car, or take this job. Like I in the end have to, you know, make the decision. So no matter how many people I consult, I have to be hopefully I'm well formed to be able to make the proper decision. Even if I listen to her, listen to Brad, listen to Sam, you know, taking in the diverse opinions and the whole internet. 
to be able to um, make that decision myself. Um, point 38, the highest, truest glory depends upon the following three things. The affection, confidence, and mingled admiration esteem of the people. Well, that's interesting. That sounds like a fallacy you know, to the people. But again, he's not saying that. He's not saying like, hey, I just become a TikTok star. And if everyone wants to follow your channel, that's all that matters. The pragmatism, if it works. Whatever you do to get 10 million followers on Twitter, that's what he means like, the admiration of the people, the esteem of the people in this intellectual sense of like, you are esteemed by them because you actually are what they purport you to be, that you are this good, temperate leader, right? And if you have the esteem, of, and Cicero did, Cicero was widely regarded by all types of people, both the common man and woman and people like Julius Caesar, the real power brokers who are always trying to get him into their, into their inner, inner circles as being like the top quality intellectual. And so he would say that, uh, you know, probably with a lot of humility about himself. Like I've geared my life, aimed my life at being worthy of the esteem of my fellow men and women. Okay, uh, what else here? This is Ryan Alexander. It's too bad he's not here anymore. Page, page 63.41. If therefore anyone wishes to win true glory, let him discharge, discharge the duties required by justice. So if you want actual glory, live in a moral life and that, that will be your crowning glory. The morality itself. Um, what else here? I encourage you to get anyone who wants to get this book. Um, it's a very, very good book. It's him just talking the entire time. It's like a, it's basically a monologue. He's writing a letter to his son, right? Uh, like a final point here. I'm obviously skipping over a bunch of stuff here. Okay, this is point number 48, page 101, very much at the end. But the function of wisdom is to discriminate between good and evil, whereas in as much as all things morally wrong or evil, trickery prefers the evil to the good. So if, if we've established everything you talked about in the pursuit of truth and justice, and we want people who are called to be leaders to be leaders in society, this is why we must avoid so-called corrupt leaders or unfit people for office, because if they are unfit by virtue of pursuing evil, they will always be dishonest. That to me is a very logical point. Trickery prefers evil to the good, of course. If I'm trying to bend the rules, even like if I wanted to rig the Super Bowl, bring our conversation full circle. Yeah, that, that's a wrong thing to do. It's wrong to cheat, even in agreeing with you earlier. It's, it's a football game. Who cares? It's not life or death, but it's just wrong to do that. It's wrong to cheat playing cards with your brother or something, right? So trickery always lends itself to evil by virtue of itself being evil, objectively speaking, right? So, yeah. Uh, If anyone agrees that it is not morally right to be king in a state that was once free and ought to be free now, with what remonstrance, rather with what appeal, should I try to tear him away from so strange a delusion? St. Thomas More makes this point in Utopia. There is no honor in being king or queen of people who are eating dirt. What I mean is if the only way you become king or queen is by, by destroying everyone, enslaving them, denying them education, you know, there's no point in being a king of people that you've purposely stunted their growth, right? A true king should not be afraid of... Comp I, I made people dirt. A great example in North Korea. Kim Jong-un is, 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 is the king of a country that is so terrorized by his horrible policies, right? And the famine and stuff. There's nothing worthy there. The guy's a tyrant. It's destroyed. It's, there's nothing beautiful about that. He might say, well, I had to do that because I don't want challengers. A true king or queen, Cicero says, doesn't fear greatness because he or she himself or herself are great, and they actually want to rule other great people. If you rule people who are all terrible, it's like, oh, I beat, I'm an NFL player who beat a high school team in a game. Cool, man. If I'm an NFL player who beat other NFL players, that's great, right? If you're a king or queen who rules other kings and queens, that's really something, right? That's the point. That's what you should aim for. How many leaders don't? They want the populace to be dumb or like, you know, uncapable just follow me blindly a true king or queen should want to rule his equals but be them being his equal they won't he won't rule them he'll rule kind of with them kind of thing right well the way to become a leader like that is be maybe or at least it helps to be a little smarter than the other folks and come up with good ideas so they'll follow you exactly let's kind of finish on that that's a great point um yeah, like and I told you, I have a lot of respect for politicians. I mean that. I've said this so many times. A politician comes into office, they're going to be hated by the other people right away. Already 50% of people hate me. And pretty soon my people are going to hate me too, right? Because I don't, I'm not doing 
platform fast enough or the only reason I voted for you is you promised to do these things. You're not, you know, so like they're hated by everyone. Um, I think following Cicero, if you're called to be a political leader, if you have those talents, I think one of the greatest talents of a political leader is probably thick skin. You can take criticism well, right? You're not offended. Like people hate you. It's like they're going to, that's part of the game. And then like Brad said so wisely, then set about winning the respect of people through good policies, good laws, have them demand. Like I want Sam Crescens to be our leader because I respect him. He's the best of us. Not I'm terrified. He's going to like torch our town kind of thing, right? That's so much of his book is about that. It's about like the consent of good virtue, binding good virtue for letting a society flourish together. Um, before I ask Father to close this out in prayer, if you would be so kind of do so, anyone have any kind of questions for me? We're done with the class. Anyone have any final questions? If not, uh, remember, you know, um, Wednesday, we're going to start. Well, actually, Wednesday's a full lecture. Is that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a one and done. We've had, you know, we had two Aristotle, I think. We had Socrates, Plato, double Aristotle, double Cicero. And we're going to get next Monday into six appointments, six classes on Thomas Aquinas. It's going to be super fun. We will, I mean, you could do, again, a whole course. And people do. People have taught the whole semester just on Thomas Aquinas. What is, what is Wednesday? So Wednesday, exactly, is a stopgap. I, it's it, on the syllabus says Augustine and Boethius. So I'll focus on those two guys. Yeah, I can't not talk about Boethius. B O E T H I U S. Boethius. He's one of the, he's a Christian, um, kind of a contemporary of Augustine in the way that he's maybe like when Augustine dies, he's born. Like they're not exact contemporaries, but same. Augustine is like 354 to 430 AD. I think Boethius is like, Boethius is like four or something to 510. Boethius writes the greatest work of antiquity, the last class work of antiquity. He's a Christian already, but he writes the last on, on duties thing called the Consolation of Philosophy, which in a very secular sense just says like, here's how you can live a good life just by practical reason. So we'll talk about Augustine and him. Father, if you'd close us out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, our Father, we continue to thank you for your great testimonies and Lord. We ask you to be with us through the course of this day. Bless our efforts, bless Dr. Bashan for all he's doing for the church. Bless each and every one of us. Bless your people everywhere through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Yeah. Be with Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Peace be with you. Thank you.